Welcome to the Crit House, everyone. I'm Jeff Larson, and we have, I think, a pretty special show here today. We are venturing away from the uh, the genres that we've looked at before, street and documentary and a little portraiture, and we're going into the world of fine art, and we are doing that with some very impressive people. Thomas Jackson is here with us on the lower right. He is a uh, he was when he started out in New York, an editor and book reviewer very early in his career. And then as he started as a photographer, he was a, a street photographer, a la Gary Winogrand inspired sort of street scenes. And then he did some landscapes and finally installation work uh, that he does today. His photography has been shown around the world and he was in critical mass as top, top 50. And he won the installation still life category of the photo uh, PDNs, the curator award back in 2013. Thomas, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing the discussion. And Jane Zabo is here. She is also a, uh, a fine art photographer. She is an LA conceptual artist. She has a background in creating props and miniatures. Um, and she has a set construction for the, uh, done set construction for film and the amusement industry. Her work has also been seen widely internationally in museums and exists in private collections worldwide. She has been published in the Huffington Post, and Lens Scratch, and a number of other magazines, many other places. Uh, and Jane, it's great to have you with us as well. Happy to be here. Thank you. And our photographer today is, uh, I will say, a good friend of mine. Uh, Connie Lowell is a New England-based uh, photographic artist. She uses digital, traditional, and alternative processes to depict her reflections on the world. So let's take a look at Connie's work. So Connie. We see a lot of your work up on the screen right now. Tell us about yourself and your work and the kind of things that you're looking for from a critique and a review. Sure, so I live in Southern New Hampshire and I am a New England based artist. I started using photography artistically about seven years ago. Um, I'm definitely focusing more on the fine art space um, and I was doing more traditional photography and I started to sort of veer off into other ways of using the media. And I have a really strong connection with the natural world. And it's hard for me, I go back to places where I grew up and I see um, the impact that climate change and the Anthropocene is having on the planet and on uh, life on the planet and that started to become more the subject of my work at this point so that's uh really what i've been doing recently and as far as what i'd like to hear um if possible so the group of images you're looking at i they're all part of a project and i really struggle sometimes with when i'm doing a project am i creating the same work over and over or am i really creating unique pieces that are more of a body of work that are cohesive so that's something i'd like to hear about um and other than that i, I any any feedback would be welcome thanks connie uh thomas do you want to start off with some thoughts about what you're oh, saying i just love to hear how how these pieces are created like these are your photographs I assume and you make a print and then you do this post process on them like how how big are the prints how are you actually burning them if that's what you're doing and and talk yeah. us through that so I take uh I take the dig they're digital to begin with I print them on eight by ten and I chose a specific paper that's got a resin coating I'm using the material I've scraped off of sparklers to put onto the paper and ignite that. Oh. And so uh, in some cases, you'll see that it's burnt through. The white that you see is really, uh, it's burnt through. And in other cases, it hasn't burnt quite all the way through. So you're almost doing a, um, the, Kai, the Chinese pyrotechnic artist who who does uh, daytime fireworks. His, his Instagram is Studio Kai, but I can't remember his entire name. But he, a lot of his his actual like studio work is is 
doing fireworks on paper and and you know doing these conflagrations that leave you know amazing patterns and burn marks on paper um i like that i mean i like how they 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 raise a lot of questions you 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 sort of you see them and you see that there, there's some some trauma has occurred and and you kind of you know you want to know what it's all about um I, I'm, I'm definitely thinking some of some other artists as well um one of them that pops into my mind is is matthew swartz who who uh shoots four by five film in you know of a you know of a lake in nevada or something and then he takes the piece of film and without exposing it to any more light dunks it in the water and shakes it around and then has it processed and and it has this 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 crazy sort of um look to it um another artist that that i think you should really check out is a guy that i know from when i was lived in brooklyn his name is davide cantoni he's italian and he uh projects images from mainly from the new york times onto a wall or a table and then takes a magnifying glass and burns the images into paper. Um, and that was my first thought when I thought saw these is that you were using a magnifying glass. Um, uh, but but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm intrigued, I like them. Jane, what's your reaction to what you're seeing in your thoughts? Um, you know, very much in line with what Thomas had to say and I was, I appreciate the explanation of how they were done because the one thing that I noted was that the burned areas seemed very specific, very controlled, very intentional about where the burn happened, um, which seemed to me would, you know, at first I was thinking, you know, you're holding a lighter or something. And I think that would have been very hard to control. So you're, um, the process that you've chosen to do this with, I think works amazingly well. Um, I really like the, the, you know, the color palette is very cohesive. I do think it is, and I understood your question about, is it the same thing happening over and over again, or is it a body of work? And I would say, yes, it is a body of work. Um, a body of work is going to have some repetition, um, but you're definitely going to many locations where this climate change is becoming evident. So I think you have to have repetition um, the one big question I had was the smokestack and my thought on that, and I, I don't have a right answer for you, but my first question is, is it too obvious? Do you need to tell us that specifically that that is what these are about? Part of me says, yes, maybe you do need to have one or two that relay that information, but I think we understood what this was about without being so literal. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the one big thing that I wasn't sure about. Um, they do have this wonderful poetic stillness and a beauty that I do appreciate. I think, I mean, I live in the West where everything's on fire all of the time now. Um, so I can't not look at fire on the landscape without understanding um, what the intention of that um, process is. Um, you know, and I guess the other question would be fire is one symptom of climate change, but there's other things. So if you want it to be about bigger issues, and I don't have an answer for you, mm -hmm. but how do you um, illustrate water shortages or um, other things that are going to become, on, you know, plagues and viruses and um, insects or whatever, the, you know, just the death of a species, is that um, also information you would be wanting to cover? Or is this specific to um, fire? And I think that's when you choose to burn something, it um, makes the conversation be about that one element. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And, you know, so my, I was, I was thinking about the Cuyahoga River fire was sort of the genesis for this particular project. 
because of the, as a catalyst to the Clean Water Act. So um, it's, I think to your point, it's now the, the occasion of fire has become a, a central theme, whether I intended it to or not. And I think they're absolutely lovely and beautiful and they, they do make you stop and they do make you um, try. I like that there's some uncertainty about what they're about. Um, and that was my big hang up with the, the smokestack because it was so, it was kind of heavy handed to me. And I don't know that you have to go there. I mean, I, I wonder if you might want to experiment with different ways of degrading your prints, you know, would that, would that go beyond fire? I mean, I don't, I don't know what that would be exactly, whether it's, you know, chemical or temperature or, or uh, you know, something, something that could be like a long-term process, sort of like a Andy Goldsworthy sculpture turning, turning, going back to nature or right. something, you know. Um, well, knowing a little bit about Connie's history, you've done some of that in other areas using water, maybe not degrading the image, but using other alternative processes in your... I, I think it, it, this is great to hear because my gears are turning and I'm thinking about the fact that a lot of the work that I've done recently has brought together photography and some natural thing. And whether it's, um, uh, for instance, I've been doing salt prints and I've been using seawater instead of a regular, you know, formula of sodium and, and water, or I've been doing uh, cyanotypes where I'm using sea sponges to let it, the chemicals move into the paper and then, you know, using those same sponges to let water push that chemistry away. So. I am starting to do a little of that. And I really wanted to find other ways to let the natural elements of the planet, whether it's light or wind or whatever, act on photographs. Yeah. Um, so so you, you're giving me a lot to think about. Check out, check out Megan Rippenhoff's work too, oh, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm pronouncing her name right. Yeah, um, her you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm more and more of a fan of, of taking sort of a generative approach, mm -hmm. making art. Um, can, 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 you really, explain, I mean, can you explain? Can you explain what a generative approach is for those of us? Also, <laughs> so basically, um, instead of uh, you're you're relying on an outside, uh, it could be a computer algorithm or it could be a natural phenomenon to to sort of create the art, either with you or, or for you. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of this going on in the digital world where people will come up with like a, an algorithm that will sort of create a, a crazy image. But, but from my perspective, with my work, I mean, I've been making these, these wind-driven installations where I basically, I put up this fabric in a setting and then I basically let the elements do the rest. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'm, it's almost sort of like I'm outsourcing the, uh, the, the real decision making in, in my, my work, which I sort of like. Um, but, I, but I think there's something really appealing about, about that sort of approach. Um, and, and, I, and I see a lot of artists doing that right now, like, like Megan Rippenhoff. Um, and I think it's really, it's really interesting and it's really stimulating for the viewer. And I think, you know, because if you are thinking about climate change that you have um, a whole pool of ingredients to draw from. You have you have fire, but we also have you know we have water issues. We have um, smog. Um, there's an artist named Kim Abelis who does um, a whole series of work on smog, and she just leaves. Um, she'll basically leave a stencil out and then leave let it sit outside, and then the particulate creates the image for her. So there's so many ways of, you know, is it UV damage? Is it, um, I think this is a really wonderful start, um, but I think it is one ingredient to the larger body of work perhaps. And it's to you to figure out what other ingredients, is it a chemical process that 
you know, is it chlorine because we have, there was a chlorine spill over here or something like that. If you can bring in more ingredients and manipulate the work in a specific way. And I think that was some of the questions with the fire on the water. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about the, um, and I know the river fire, you know, now that you said that I, I understood that, but at first I didn't really understand yeah. why would the fire be at the ocean? Um, you know, to me, maybe the ocean is more about erosion. Um, you know, is there some way to bring in, and again, it's a fine line between being um, suggestive or inferring without being super literal. Right. And that's a, that's a hard um, challenge for you to find the right way to visualize that, I think. Yeah, that's, candidly, that's been one of the biggest struggles I've had is I've been trying to develop my art and, and refine it and make it, frankly, more interesting. It's staying away from that literal, uh, literal tendency is challenging at this time. It is, it is, because we, you know, we're trying to communicate, um, when we make work, we have an intention, we're maybe trying to communicate a message. Um, mm -hmm. You're trying to get your message out into the world and you want to do it in such a way that draws people in, um, but without being so, let's just use the word preachy, that right. you already turn off the audience because they know exactly what you're trying to tell them. And yeah. it's finding a, a delicate balance. And I think the work is really so, this one for some reason, just, I love, you know, I'm so drawn to this. The placement couldn't be better of where those burns are happening. Um, because it starts looking like fungus and there's, you know, I see so many layers of interpretation. Is it the decay of the root system of the plants? Um, and maybe this is about the erosion and then where you put the burns helps indicate the message a bit more. That's actually a question I had is, uh, are, there, are there any specific images that you're looking at that, I know Jane, you like this one, um, you express your, pleasure with it. Are there, are there ones that you look at and say that one really communicates well and these not so well? Or is that a fair question to ask? For me, the only one that was really the not so well was the one with the smokestack in it. Um, and they all have a wonderful lyrical poetry. Um, and I guess, I think they make more sense to me when the, the, the charring is on the landscape as opposed to on the beach. Um, Thomas, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I guess I, I know now that Jane makes that very astute observation. But um, then this one to me, I'm just this one is stunning. So it's yeah. like there's not there's not a right or wrong answer. And sometimes it is just an emotional response. Um, like this one is just drop dead beautiful. And I don't necessarily have to know why the fire is on the ocean or on the lake or wherever we are. Um, so I don't so, have a right or wrong answer, but sometimes you just feel it. Well, so that's, <clears throat> so coming to this from, from, from an uneducated standpoint and from a person who doesn't um, really understand fine art either, that's a question I always have when I go to see um, images is sometimes you, you know, I, I don't, I'm less interested in the story than I am in the image. And for me, being pulled into the to the image is really important, which will take me into the story. So, um, is that is I mean, is that do you do you start with the image or do you start with the story when you're when you're trying to put together a body of work, or does that make any sense at all? Am I just? Are you asking um, us or Connie? Um, I'm, I'm asking both of you, and I guess Connie too. I mean, I, I would I, I might insert process into that question too like image process uh, replace story with process perhaps or, or maybe just add it um right right i mean i'm, I'm sort of process obsessed and and that's that's what i think about and for me i'm very narrative and you know conceptually based i'm driven by the ideas um but the ideas can't um take precedent over the visuals either to me they're equally important um, because the visuals are the first thing you see. And though I may have a narrative and ideas behind my work, um, 
I also like to leave it open ended enough that the viewer can bring in their own interpretations into the work. So again, I go back to the smokestack. You didn't leave me much room for thinking in that one. Whereas right. with these, um, with all of the others, I have enough um, room to create my own um, understanding of what's happening in the world. And I guess some of these, you know, it's, some of these are more, they're not always so clear that they're burns, at least the way that we see them yeah. here. In a way, I think that's effective for you because um, it lets us think it's some other um, disruption that's happening. Is it the giant fungus that's coming in and eating the land? I mean, I don't always know for sure that it's a burn and I think that's helpful. So here's, here's an aesthetic question. What about the fact that it's it's paper white behind the burns? Um, is is that a, is that a conscious decision to make it paper white, or 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 is there a, is there a question about whether it should have a little bit of tone in that space? From my perspective, yes. Yeah. So I opted. I, this is white right here. What you're seeing is white in part because of the way that I captured these to share them digitally. But uh, the fact is I thought about putting different colors behind or different hues and tones. And I wanted to have a really strong sense of absence mm -hmm. are with the sense of presence with the image for the ones that are like really burnt through and there's really pieces missing. I wanted it to be super strong and super evident that there was something completely gone versus an image like this where I was fine with the fact that the image was disrupted but may maybe not totally obliterated. So um, the white was a way to just ensure that there was no question that there was a complete and total absence of image. And black would, I think, would have been too subtle. I think you would have walked up and tried to figure out what you were looking at, yeah. that in something in the black, you know what I mean? So that's where I ended up with the white. Sometimes I look at it and question whether I arrived at the right answer. I think for me, the white is, is the exact right answer. It is negative space, it is a hole. Um, it is a void, and this is what we're losing in the world. So to me, the white is sends the correct message. I, I have to say that this image is up right now is just I, I keep coming back to and looking, going, oh, I love this. It's just it's just beautiful. I think it's really moving, nicely done with that. And I said this earlier, but I'm so drawn to the color palette. I'm drawn to the just this monotone bleakness. Um, I don't know that this would work as well if it was beautiful spring green colors and flowers. There's something, um, it's a seasonal death, but it's a bigger death than that. Right. So last thoughts, Thomas, any suggestions? What's your parting, parting wisdom for Connie? I mean, I guess, I guess I would, I would elaborate on what we said before, which is that this is a really interesting idea that could be explored in different ways. Um, and and I, I would try to, to take it in, in different directions and, and certainly keep doing this, but also just experiment with different ways, experiment with different ways of sort of doing this post adjustment production degradation to these images um, and, and see where it goes um, because you never know. And that could take the next step could take you in another direction, and the next step could take you in another in another direction. So, I would just keep experimenting. Jane, we'll give you the last word. I agree completely with that. Keep experimenting, but also keep in mind what the intention behind the work is. And when you choose your ingredients and elements to do this disruption with, um, you know, those are very specific ingredients that you want to know why you're picking. Um, those materials to make those disruptions with. But keep it up. I think you're on to a, a great start. It's very intriguing work. Thank you both so much. It's really helpful to have your feedback on these.
now I have a lot of ideas going, so I'm excited. Well, well I, I look I, forward to staying connected and following to see where you go with this. Thank and you. we will have uh, information on how you can see Connie's work as well as Thomas's and Jane's as well on the uh, in the comment section down below. Uh, so please take a look at that. And if you are interested in participating in the Crit House, um, please drop us a line uh, through our website. You can uh, at thecrithouse.com. It's certainly a great way to be able to, first of all, stay in touch with us, um, but also to let us know that you're interested in showing your work. And uh, we are trying to show as many different genres of photography as we can. So if you are not doing fine art or some of the things that we have done in the past with either street or documentary or portrait work, we would love to see it and we would love to be able to uh, to talk about it. I want to thank Connie. Connie, thank you so much. It's always, a, it's a, it takes a lot of bravery to put your work out there in front of the world to see and have a, a critique as well. So uh, thank you for your courage and participating. And uh, for Thomas and uh, and Jane also, uh, there will be links below for the uh, for their site. And we'll also have uh, videos so you can get uh, more information about both of them here on The Crit House. Thank you so much for watching The Crit House. <laughs>